Hey guys, so like the title says, my patient for today is a 2015 Ford Escape 2.0 turbo EcoBoost with uh, all-wheel drive. So if you check out my scanner, um, it was this car was stalling uh, and chugging and hesitating, and it just did not want to stay stay started. Um, the customer originally came up to like a stop sign, um, and it kept stalling on him. So my scanner is showing low pressure, fuel system pressure too low, circuit A, bank 1 or single sensor, um, let's see, sensor B circuit, bank 1, sensor B circuit, intermittent bank 1, AC refrigerant pressure, that might be something else, or it's voltage related, sensor reference voltage B circuit range performance, and throttle position sensor switch and this one can actually sometimes be a throttle body issue but before you start this repair I want you guys to see this if you guys have an older escape from 2013 or 2014 um, go online and make sure you run your VIN number in the um, National Highway Traffic um, what is it National NHTSA uh, website or the Ford website and make sure your car your escape or your focus ST has already had the recall 14 s17 or 14 s17 the engine wiring splice repair and what happens is the same symptoms that this 2015 is having so it's reduced engine power hesitation running rough stalling without warning um, it can actually be very dangerous because it can happen at any speed and it only happened uh, it happened in certain 2013 and 14 Focus STs with the 2.0 and Escape with the 2.0 and Ford is saying only 2013 to 20 uh, 2013 to 2014 but so what I'm here for what I'm here for and by the way if you guys don't uh, have a scanner yet just go on either go to O'Reilly's go to Advanced Auto Parts you can buy a pretty cheap OBD2 scanner. This one, unfortunately, wasn't that cheap. This one was 80, um, but I had to buy this for a very specific reason because it works with Forescan, which is a Ford, a free Ford software. Um, you know, it's not made by Ford, but it's a Ford-specific uh, code software that you can actually change parameters on your from a laptop on your Ford. Um, I did it on my F-150 to shut off the fake engine noise that comes through the speakers. Um, I did it to change a lot of things. You can turn your daytime running lights off. Um, you can um, stop the double horn honk when you get out of the car and you leave the keys in the car. Uh, that was the number one thing I needed to stop. You can even like make your turn signal your changing lanes turn signal go for more blinks <laughs> so even goofy stuff like that but anyways this guy was 80 bucks in 2018 off of Amazon and now it's only 60 for another version of it called the OBD link uh, LX um, and there's they even work with smartphones so this one is Android and laptop capable with Bluetooth and so this one is, I highly recommend this one. And they're not paying me to say that. They don't even know I exist. So anyways, this 2015 Ford Escape. So I was reading some of the TSBs, the technical service bulletins, on uh, Ford's website and online in general. And this one, this one kind of narrowed it down. SSM 47575. And if you skip through all the, these are all the DTCs, the d diagnostic trouble codes that it could um, show in your scanner. And it says, the vehicle may also exhibit an all-wheel drive fault warning or traction control light on because it can, this specific issue can set off all the idiot lights on the cluster. So it says, uh, check, inspect the wiring harness from the battery junction box to the PCM. Uh, power control module, which is a fancy term for ECU uh, or ECM uh, for wiring harness retainers not installed correctly, allowing chafing to occur at multiple points. Um, repair damage required as required, and refer to a wiring diagram. And they don't they don't supply the wiring diagram. 
So I want to show you guys what I found on this 2015 Escape specifically. So let's go to the engine bay. And I pulled the car outside today so you guys would have a better light and better view of what I'm going to be doing. By the way, the OBD2 port is right there on the dash on the Escape. So let me show you real quick. Well, not really that quick, but... So first things first, the battery junction box... I hope you guys have a good view. The battery junction box is right here. The battery is under this cover. The first thing I would do is take the battery cover off and with a multimeter or with your OBD scanner, make sure you, you check the voltage of your battery right from here. Um, this battery was fine. Um, the one that was in this car was fine as far as I could tell, but it was already four or five years old and um, there was already, I already heard of a sluggish start this past winter, so I replaced it anyways. But um, when the car's not running, it should be 12 and a half, right around 12 to 12 and a half volts. And then when it's running, it should be right around 14 to 14 and a half volts. And do yourself a favor when you check the running voltage. Turn off heated seats, turn off the air conditioner, so you can get a good uh, full voltage uh, reading when the car is running. But anyways, let me show you guys. The engine cover comes off, it's got four rubber grommets. That was the front two. I actually greased the grommets uh, with some anti-seize. So they don't, they don't uh, sometimes they're so stuck on that they can break the cover while you're trying to lift the cover off. See what the grommets look like? So set that aside. And so they say, like I said, the technical service bulletin says um, trace from the battery junction box, which is right, as far as I know, is right here. This has got um, some circuitry in it, and the positive cable from the battery goes up through this, this box, right behind the air filter box, to the positive post on the battery. So battery junction box, the harness runs underneath the intake underneath the air intake, uh, the air cleaner box, and it comes back up right here. And here's your um, intake air temperature sensor. And if you look at this harness, so yet yesterday I already did this, um, I already did the research and checked this fix for you guys before I posted this, of course. So go ahead and if you take a quick, a really close look, at this over here, see see how the, I already cut the sheathing off the wires as you can see, but I could tell from that um, after, so let me just go through the repair. So disconnect your vacuum lines. There's two push buttons on this one, one on each side. I just pushed them in with my thumbnail, my fingernail. So try and set that guy aside without, you know, being gentle about it and then Take this guy off. This is an, this is I'm pretty sure this is the vacuum pump, the cam driven vacuum pump. My uh, F-150 has the same thing. Uh, you got to squeeze both of these tabs in and gently pull it off like that. And then this green uh, vacuum line has two tabs. I hope you guys can see that. It has two little tabs. So if you pry them to the su to the side, see how easy that was to slide down? And then push the top half circle one and that will come off very easily, like that. And then try and set that aside to not spring back in your face during the repair. But check this out. So here's what I found. If you guys take a look, see that clean shiny metal right there? on that cam, that vacuum pump, that shiny metal tells you something, that something is rubbing it at all times with all the engine movement. So see how the, the corrosion, the aluminum corrosion looks different up here and it's all powdery and, and uh, dusty. But if you look at that, um, I'm sure you can see that because I'm pretty close. 
that is super shiny and that's been rubbing my my harness here this is my main harness that goes to every coil pack fuel injector even the cam sensors i'm sure you guys can see those i bet those are the cam sensors right here uh you know but anyways so when we go over here and i'm gonna get some light for you guys some extra light it didn't, it's plenty bright outside, but there's no light this far under the engine bay. So, what I did was, I took an X-Acto knife and cut open the... First I popped this off to make it a little bit easier to get some uh, play. So I took an X-Acto knife and very carefully... You shouldn't really use an X-Acto knife, you should use a sheath cutting tool because they, uh, they have a special way about them that won't cut the wires. But so if you if you go into this harness, which which I have already done yesterday, and check these wires, so there was three wires resting against that very shiny aluminum. One of them was this blue striped white. Another one was this white striped brown, and this brown striped blue. So you might be able to see the indentation, but let me get a, um, I'm going to get a mirror to show you this. Hopefully my, uh, my GoPro can catch this. As you guys know, I don't have a cameraman, but um, give me one second as I'm cleaning my mirror for you guys. So. If you take a good look at that, you can see that the insulation, the insulation is, is missing. And I can see strands of wire, copper wire, right there um, on that blue striped white. So not so much with the, the white striped brown. Let's see, which ones were they? And the brown striped blue. I don't see, it, it didn't go through the insulation all the way, but you can believe, you better believe that white, uh, blue striped white, it went right through um, all the way to the copper wire. So that is just enough. Even though it's only like one or two strands showing, that's sending a, that's sending a ground signal off this uh, vacuum pump. It's shorting to ground. That can, with, you know, this is a CAN bus car, a C-A-N CAN bus car, and that can cause all types of, um, of issues, you know, from, from faulty misfires to um, thinking that you have bad gas, thinking, thinking that it's the throttle body. Um, Ford has been, I've seen a lot, unfortunately, I've seen a ton of um, customers with escapes saying that Ford replaced their high pressure fuel pump and they replaced their in tank low pressure pump and the, the issue never went away um, and they've replaced I've heard them replace so many things one Ford dealer did a timing belt job thinking that there was something wrong with the timing um, from this stalling issue because they claimed there was coolant um, mixed into the oil and uh, sure enough the the Ford dealer did the did the job the timing belt job and it's the same result it started stalling again on the customer uh, like a couple weeks later um, but anyways so I hope I hope this helps some of you guys I know this isn't going to be a very this isn't a very easy fix to do roadside or in the garage but you know what Mine is very minor right now, and what I'm going to do is is take a pick. What I'm going to do is take a pick around that blue and white wire, since only one strand of copper is showing, and I'm going to snake electrical tape underneath underneath this wire and wrap it around. Um, so that'll be one thing, and then. I'm going to triple check that none of the other copper is showing in those other two wires that were, that were touching on the vacuum pump, like I said right there in that shiny corner. 
I'm gonna make sure none of those are compromised and I'm gonna electrical tape the hell out of this spot on the harness and I'm gonna try and adjust maybe adjust this um, this retainer on this valve cover stud to be a little farther forward so it keeps the harness from touching the vacuum pump um, I'm sure I can do something. You know, I'm not going to use the exact same position that it was in because it's just going to eventually happen again. And this Escape only has 78,000 miles, but that's enough miles for, you know, the engine to shift front and back, front and back as you as you hit the accelerator to um, to rub up against uh, to cause tension on this harness and just keep rubbing very slightly over and over. I'm kind of, I'm very surprised actually that with 78,000 miles that that isn't in worse shape, um, but the, uh, that that wire wasn't in worse shape, but um, it's, it's in bad enough shape where if it's touching the ground, it's going to cause all sorts of issues with the car. But like I was saying, if you, if you already know that you have a good battery, You've tested your voltage to be at least at 12, 12 and a half without the engine running. If you if you do have a bad battery and it's it's under 12 volts, say it's like I had a 2003 Escape one time that was doing these crazy things. The wipers were going on when the engine was off. The key wasn't even in the ignition and it was misfiring and it was doing all these other types of you know bizarre issues the first thing I checked was the battery and the voltage was right around 9 volts so with that kind of voltage going to the ECM it's just gonna do it's gonna set the car haywire so the first thing that I would do is replace that battery if it's you know if it's say under under 12 volts the cheap one of the cheapest things even though the battery is gonna be at least a hundred bucks from like a good Exide battery from Home Depot, or a DECA, D-E-K-A battery, um, or an Interstate, There's, they, they still have good batteries. They're at least gonna be 100 to 150 bucks, but like I said, if your voltage is under 12, you gotta start with a battery. And then, but like I said, if you